Uh, welcome back to the last session um, of uh, our Saturday uh, convention, in which we're very pleased to be able to uh, welcome Joan Bakewell. Now, oh, well, you haven't heard me yet. I'm obviously a hard act to follow, I'm sorry to say. I'm sure, I'm sure they'll give the same applause to you. Um, and Joan, 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 of course, um, uh, needs very little introduction because she's the main reason you've all come to convention this year, um, as we know. Um, all of us, most of us, um, will uh, have been familiar with Joan as a presence in national life, in our lives, um, for almost all our lives. Certainly that's uh, true in my case. We're very lucky that such a pioneer on so many fronts for, for women, for humanists, and in so many different uh, ways, um, has recently got formally involved uh, in the humanist movement, um, having been uh, in it uh, personally for some time, um, because Joan is currently the co-chair of the all-party parliamentary humanist group, which, in which capacity she's an extremely active advocate um, on our issues uh, in the House of Lords, where she sits um, as a peer. A uh, long list of achievements, um, of course. Um, uh, Humanist of the Year in 2017, very illustrious um, award, almost as illustrious, recently made a fellow of BAFTA. <laughs> and I think that, uh, you know, that's also pretty grand. Um, but I won't go any further because there's too much uh, to list. So, Joan, welcome. Thank you for... Nice uh, to be here. Very nice to be with you. For coming here. Um, so you are uh, now the chair of the Parliamentary Humanist Group, but it doesn't stop you making the occasional foray into churches, and even Westminster Abbey, you were telling me that yes, last week. Um, it's very interesting, the relationship of um, Parliament to the church. Uh, we do have, I think it's 23 bishops sitting in the House of Lords as of right. I think it might be 26. 26 yeah. They don't all turn up at the same time. They do tend to turn up in large numbers when the issue of dignity and dying is raised because they have strong views about it. Not always very informed views, I don't think myself. However, um, so that's when we see the most bishops. But the point is, um, the, the church the, uh, intrudes in many ways in Parliament. I mean, all sessions of Parliament begin with prayers. Um, and I only ever go to prayers when I want to get a good seat because I want to make a point in the debate that's to follow. Because if you're in the chamber for prayers, you get the best seats. So, um, so I kind of cross my fingers and go in for prayers <laughs> um, and, and sit where I can be heard. So it's really important. Um, what is interesting is that um, Westminster Abbey has a relationship, obviously, with Parliament, immediately opposite. And it also um, sets up a series of dialogues with a number of uh, parliamentarians, commons and lords, whom it invites across in numbers, say, something like 16 to 20, for a lunchtime discussion of a moral issue. It isn't, doesn't press the church issue, but we, I went to a very interesting one about how to restore trust into parliamentarians, and various parliamentarians came along and said what they felt had gone wrong with the relationship between the public uh, and, the, the, and the rulers. And um, the last one I went to was interesting because of a tiny incident, not tiny to me, but um, it's passed unnoticed for most people. In the course, it was about meditation. And in the course of explaining, the canon of the church was going to explain how useful meditation was in our harassed lives, but also how it was a way of soothing your mind and letting other ideas come in. And as he introduced it to a group of us, all sitting around in a circle, hands on our knees, he said, so it's, it applies for everyone. It applies for people of faith and people of no faith. He felt by saying that, that he was making us all welcome, not me. Afterwards, I collared him and I said, do you realize that when you say people of faith and people of no faith, you are implicitly suggesting that we have a lack, that we are in some way lacking what the others have. Because as a humanist, we have a faith a positive faith, and we don't like to be referred to as people of no faith. 
we don't have a supernatural faith. We have a faith in hum the human spirit. And he was surprised. He said, is that really so? I didn't, I'm so sorry, I didn't realize. And I said slightly peevishly, I do hope you remember in future. <laughs> and, but in these troubled times when language is so much abused, it's really important to be exact and not to take from others a definition of ourselves which we don't acknowledge and which is, it can, although they may not mean it, be used to put us down, you know, to see us as outsiders, as cracks, as outside the really belonging people who have faith. So I don't put up with it, and I urge you not to put up with it either. That's, I mean, obviously the lesson you take from that is um, trying to, you know, where possible, politely, but firmly press the case that humanists have positive beliefs. And in this instance, that was met with, you know, met hospitably. Yeah. But you've noticed, I think, also some hostility and antagonism since you started, you know, taking a humanist brief in the Lords, as it were, speaking up on these issues. I'm thinking of faith schools most recently. There was a pretty vitriolic pushback. Yes, um, I always, we use, the, the, there are a small group in the Lords. The ha House of Lords is, I would say, primarily unthinking members of the Church of England. Yeah. One or two of them were thinking enough when the church took on um, gay marriage to leave the church and join the Catholic church. So they are people of faith, they would say, people of Christian faith. And I think it's very important to relate to such people. So I asked a question in the house. Uh, it, had a, it was a particular case, actually, that uh, you drew my attention to, which was about faith schools and how they're on the increase and they're much being encouraged by the government, they're being funded out by the taxpayer. And for humanist parents who want their children not to be indoctrinated in a faith school by that faith, it's very, it limits their choice. And indeed, some humanist parents have made it known that, that the spread of choices that they have of schools in their area are all religious, that they find that they can't find a good school which does not have a religious foundation. So I put it to the house, you have a session, question time, like Prime Minister's question time, they're better behaved. Um, and I said, so what is a humanist parent to make um, if they are at the ch education of their children um, is limited and they have not the scope for choice which they are entitled to as their child is being educated at taxpayers' expense. The question was dismissed as almost foolhardy by the front bench and indeed by the other people who spoke, one or two humanists in the Lords had been primed to give me their support, but question time is very fluid and they didn't get to speak. What did happen what was emerged the hostility that existed to the idea of a non-religious education. Pe peer after peer stood up to tell me what I already knew, that church schools offer a very good education. What their caveat was, so, so why are you making such a fuss? They, and they they reinforced each other's statements. These schools are wonderful. They're the best schools. Everyone wants their children to go to a church school. And they took the debate off into a completely irrelevant area because they refused to acknowledge the point I was making, a small administrative but significant point for those who don't belong to the, tr the traditional religions. So I felt, I mean, I felt that the, the um, debate had been useful in that it had put it on the agenda, but not very encouraging in that it had been sort of almost universally rejected by the House of Lords. Incidentally, take comfort from the fact that they're all enormously old uh, <laughs> and they're, they're likely to be reformed sometime soon, I hope. Well, what is interesting is that, you know, people who have had and I'm included in the very old um, myself, that the, the influence of the, year, the decades of lifetime don't, you, you, it's hard to become a very questioning person as you get older because your whole life has been premised on what you learned and 
believed as a child from your family. And I, that applies to me too, because most specifically, I think it's very important that we don't antagonize the religious community or indeed the faith system of the country on the basis that we're against you and we're the, we're the crowd who feel that we have superior knowledge. I think that's very damaging. You can have, hold your opinion in private as to what you feel, but I think we need to be aware that we are part of a community of faiths in the plural and that it's bad to antagonize particularly aging, dogmatic men, can I say. Sorry about that, but it's true. Um, and it's, we need to keep the, the paths of belonging open. And I, I say that myself because I'm steeped in the Church of England. I am steeped in it. I was, I was christened early. I was um, um, confirmed when I was about 13, which is when the... Uh, doubts arose and I do remember at my confirmation classes being taken by a bishop and saying to him it's very interesting I'm taking note of all this biblical quotation but what evidence is there that any of it's true and that really cut me off from everybody that was really uh, not to be said in such company and I thought well that's interesting because they didn't bother to answer it uh, <laughs> so I perhaps keep asking it um and I'm still asking it. Where did humanism come into your life? Was it in the 60s? I mean, when did you start thinking, well, here's a positive commitment to, you know, um, liberal values and compassion for others? Well, and it, be it became very clear to me as I grew up with the precepts of the Church of England, um, the Ten Commandments, the teaching of Jesus, and then all that, and St. Paul again, and all that subsequently came into it. I mean, I did all, I know, knew it, and I could quote it and I belong to it and then I began to see that it was all the most magnificent myth uh, and I have nothing against myths as myths uh, and that began to put it into another segment of my imagination and my intellect mm. because there was enough behavior going on at the time I mean you know I was a child during the war so there's was, was more enormous cruelty going on in the war we subsequently learned afterwards about the Holocaust. People were going out and uh, the fathers of my friends, not my own father, were going out and getting killed. Some of them ended up in Japanese prisoner of war camps and we were doing all this because two supposedly Christian nations were fighting each other. So there was a lot that really, really didn't make sense and people don't have logical answers. Um, as a last resort, they will say things like, we are set, we are tested, we are being tested, um, um, and it is set, sent by God to make clear how much he loves you, that throughout all this <laughs> suffering, he will bring you love and consolation. He does indeed bring love and consolation. People find great consolation in believing in a particular set of faith, which is why they're enormously reluctant to give it up particularly as they grow older, people get ill, people are bereaved, people are widowed, widows. They, people need some sort of comfort and they find it in old-fashioned beliefs, quotations from the Bible, beautiful literature. You know, King James Bible is sublime language. Um, the writings of Dunn, the sermons of, um, of Andrews, they're all beautiful. And beauty is a great consolation. So there are all these different influences of life which come from faith, myth, belief, but they don't seem to me adequate as any kind of explanation. They are not an explanation. And when I went to university, that's what you do. You, you're looking for explanation. I read economics. I was looking for an explanation for the monetary fund and why things worked and or buying didn't. and selling, <laughs> buying, I still haven't discovered the answer for that. Um, so you look for an explanation and you look for evidence. And once that has taken hold of your mind, of course, you see the rest for what it is, which is an absolutely brilliant artifact born of man's and woman's own brain and imagination. And it is a great tribute to the human imagination and creativity that it has actually created 
all these amazing myths behind all the world's different religions. What interests me, interested me as I got older was the realization that the, the core teaching of each of those faiths, the really the important core to which we should all pay tribute, is the good of the community. The good, do unto others as you would have it done unto you. And that is a great code for any moral structure. It's the basis of humanism. Right. Yes, exactly. And we know that it's all, all over the world at all times, and it's not a unique right. you know, right. feature of any... It, it, it's part of human society. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you a bit about broadcasting, because you know we're on a perpetual crusade. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not going to mention Thought for the Day specifically, unless you want to. Um, who wants to mention Thought for the Day? Yeah. yeah. So you all want to discuss it. Um, we all oh, love it. Oh, dear, I've been... But, I've been <laughs> Well, we've all been working hard on Thought for the Day for many, many years. Yes. Many years. What's the block? What's the barrier? What's the invisible well, force um, field? I, I've never been able to quite... Well, the BBC is an institution which runs by an enormous network of managerial layers of people. So you, no one person can make a decision. If that were the case, it would have, you know, we would have had Thought for the Day, a humanist talking. <clears throat> so there's no system for making a decision, and we have been, haven't we, to yeah. see them and put this case. When I have put the case personally to individuals in this mesh of hierarchy, one of them said to me, but you know, all our programs are secular, and it's only thought for the day that gives the religious <laughs> people an opportunity. And I I thought, that is so wrong-headed. It's just, you don't know where to start with it, really. Um, I, and I couldn't really argue with it. I, I said, obviously, you know, it's a set of beliefs. and It's exactly. uh, not a mm. pernicious one. It's a, a good one. It's civically responsible. It's morally profound. Uh, it's all-inclusive and all these things. And they said, and I think, frankly, the lobby from the churches, they fear the lobby from the churches. Headlines in the Daily Mail, which, of course, as you know, the BBC lives in terror yeah. of headlines in the Daily Mail and the Sun. And uh, the, the fierce sense that they would be under attack on yet another front. They do always feel, seem to feel uniquely susceptible to that sort of attack because, you know, when we went to meet James yeah. Purnell and the, and the other uh, staff at the BBC. And it was just after this report, there was quite a good draft report, which we helped to contribute to, where the BBC, taking, I think, a leaf from a programme that you presented, said it would be much better if we repackaged all of our religion and ethics stuff as BBC beliefs, and we could make then the whole thing very inclusive and different religious and non-religious worldviews. And we said, yes, that's it. That's what we've been saying 50 years. <laughs> that's exactly correct. And then that report got posted into the BBC machinery and then sort of garbled. And by the time it came out the other end, it said, what we really need is more Christianity, you know? And now they've got this initiative to have more vicars in soap operas and more, um, you know, all the rest of it. Why are they so uniquely susceptible to church lobbies? I mean, they don't have, they used to have crack, didn't they? This, this central religious advisory committee. And we were always trying to get on crack. But the, <laughs> but, but we never did. But in, in the end, it was abolished. Um, so we thought, okay, well, those bishops, those Rethian sort of influences maybe have now gone, but they still seem in hock to it somehow. Well, there is a, the, I, I, when I first worked in the BBC, I worked for something called the Religious Department. And right. I d went on doing that for many years, staffed by many non-believers, and uh, that, was, uh, that was how it was. The head was usually a cleric. Uh, on a one occasion was a Methodist woman who was the, a <laughs> Methodist minister, a woman who was the head of religion. So it was assumed that there was something called the religious department that did religious programs, uh, discussions, often rather serious, small audiences, but very responsibly done, often very scholarly. Um, um, my contribution was largely in radio. So you're fighting something that's always existed and that's been embedded in the BBC. Then you had all these organizations called Crack and so on. I went to Granada Television, where they had a religious department. And it was, it was part of this, this country has a network of uh, belief uh, organizations, church organizations, outstripping any other country. I think it was you who were telling me, is it only Iran that has... Uh, only Iran, yeah. I mean, it's, we're, we're a, we forget what a unique, what an egregious example we are, actually, as a country. Only Iran has... Uh, is the other, Iran is the only other country with clerics. 
um, in its legislature. We're the only country in the world that has compulsory Christian daily prayers in its state schools. We're one of only four countries that allows its state religious schools to admit, you know, the Church of England is the eighth richest NGO in the world and the second biggest landowner yeah. in England. It's it's really a massive influence, and, and which you we see, see and, and most uh, people don't see that, but no, we see that. Uh, we, we, we don't see it because we, it, we take it for granted. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's in the air we breathe. We assume it. We pick up newspapers. We expect that to be the underpinning. And when there's a crisis referred to as a moral crisis, um, the country turns to the religious leaders. And that happens in the House of Lords. It's when the Archbishop of Canterbury turns up and, make, and makes a speech about... You always, I mean, the church, they all make wonderful speeches about how we must be kind to each other. And they're always on the side of the poor. These are things I approve of. I can't possibly quarrel with them because they, when they speak, they speak from the heart and concern for their diocese. And what they say is, we need more money because people are sleeping on the streets. We need um, the government to do this, that, and the other. But if there's a crisis of impending wars, or we're debating the riots in Tottenham, for example, um, then leading bishops will turn up. When a bishop stands to speak and someone else stands to speak, the, the bishop always takes precedence. Well, if six people stand to speak and one of them's a bishop, five of them sit down. The bishop takes precedence. It's in the air we breathe. It's just how it is. So changing it, it's just a change too much. Yeah. If you resist it, people get... I remember when Doreen Massey, Baroness Massey, who's a member of yeah. the Parliamentary Humanist Group as well, and she was talking in the Equality Act, and she stood up to speak and a bishop stood up to sort of speak, and people start shouting, bishop, 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 implying that she should uh, sit down. And she just said, no, we've heard enough from them. And, you know, she, they actually all just then suddenly sat down and let her speak. But it was, you know, the, 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 the opprobrium that was in the air against yes. her for even just doing that challenge was... I did make a slight um, foray into um, the BBC schedules, which arose quite by accident. Um, inappropriately, really, I was at a BBC party drinking white wine, many of those, by the way, um, and I was, it was different departments were there, and I said to the person talking to me, I, I, I've been doing some religious programs which we make basically about moral issues rather than church issues, and I said, you know, there really is scope for someone to just talk to people who have different world views. Um, um, everybody in public life, everybody in the planet has a, a world view. And people in public life who address interesting jobs and uh, profiles ha will have a fascinating world view. Some will be religious, there will be all sorts of religions. Talk to each of those and tease from them how they have arrived at their particular set of values would be really interesting. Have another glass of wine. The next day, I'm phoned by somebody in the religious department who said, did you realize you were talking to a commissioning editor and he's just commissioned the series? <laughs> so for 10 years, I did a series of 10 programs a year talking to people of different worldviews. And that's really where I learned to understand so much of how uh, religion underpins or doesn't the way people's yeah. lives and and there were there were it was fascinating i mean howard jacobson talking about being jewish we always said to the people we approached this is not a 10 minute i'm a catholic i uh, i believe i follow the catholic creed this is a half hour and it will take us deeply into your reasons and your convictions and your behavior so a lot of people said, no, I, well, I, I couldn't do that. I don't want to do that. But those who did took it very seriously. Mm. And some of them said afterwards, I've never been made to think so much as over that half hour with you saying, yes, but why do you do that? Why? And so it wasn't aggressive. It wasn't John Humphreys. It wasn't, um, you know, uh, mm. in opposition to them. I was saying, do you know, you're so different from me. Tell me. Tell me how you're different. And I think that's, in a sense, the source of a lot of my attitude to my being a humanist. Yes. We're all different. That. Some are more different than others. <laughs> that, I mean, that show, it's on, uh, most of the episodes are on the BBC yeah. website, aren't they, to download, and they're really worth, uh, you interviewed some amazing, interesting people. And some of them are used in RE classrooms. I've seen them in RE <laughs> lessons plans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
um, there is good material. I mean, uh, and some of them were very eccentric. I talked to an absolutely brilliant calligrapher who was a prize-winning um, Muslim artist whose calligraphy, he explained to me, the calligraphy, the putting on the brush to the ink and to the page was his prayer. So he prayed through the ink and the brush on the page. Now, I found that almost impossible to believe. Um, But, I mean, he spoke of it so eloquently. And I thought, I'm very fortunate to have met someone with such a unique outlook, so totally committed to what this ink and the brush are doing for him. That it may, you know, things like that make the world worthwhile if you can meet people of such extraordinary skill. And his work was exquisite. I mean, mm. great art. You're active on a lot of issues in Parliament, uh, humanists and otherwise. And I want to go um, uh, to some questions from the floor now, so I don't want to dwell too long on this. We could talk about humanist marriage, we could talk about faith schools, but maybe perhaps say something about uh, dying with dignity, dignity uh, in dying, because I know that. Um, we're about to take another legal case on this issue. Legal cases seem to come thick and fast. But your view from the inside of Parliament, how long do you think it is we're going to have to wait? Well, everything changes slowly. This is why Brexit is so strange, because it's generated a very quick pace of change, which people aren't ready for. Things change slowly. And um, when I first arrived, I thought... uh, Charles Faulkner was going taking through yeah. his dignity and dying bill. So I signed up to speak in support of it. Um, it wasn't going to, we knew it wouldn't get through, but it would air the subject. So in order to sort of air it a bit in a more congenial way or to bring people together on this basis that I think you have to talk with people you disagree with, I asked Black Rod if I could stage a play in the House of Parliament. Um, And he said, well, we've never done it before. Well, why not? My friend Nell Dunn, who is the writer who'd written Up the Junction and a lot of early plays in the 60s, had written a very moving play in which she'd interviewed a lot of her friends who'd been bereaved. And she got them to talk at length, very personally, about what bereavement and the experience of the dying body, the body giving up the spirit, um, the body going cold, the funeral and the relationship, you, the changing relationship that's involved for the person who was being bereaved. And she knit a series of talks together to make a play, which we just put on a platform with the actors reading. And the actors came, didn't charge a fee to do it. We staged it in a room um, in the House of Parliament. And I invited a lot of the peers, including Charles Faulkner. And um, I asked all the bishops, none of them, the only one of them replied. And he said, I had, would like to have come, but and there was an explanation. So there were no bishops. That's, that was all right. Because what happened was Charles Faulkner and the people who were pro-dignity and dying, we all came to it. But after it was the debate, I chaired it. So Charles and his colleagues sat on my one side. On the other side were a, a great number of peers who oppose it, um, often doctors, um, very seriously thoughtful people, not trivial people. Um, and they were very much part of the hospice movement. Um, and we got some people from the hospice movement that came along. And we debated after the play. The play had been so moving that everyone was slightly chastened and struck with a sort of grief, really, which made people mellow in their relationship with each other. And what we discovered that night, there were about 40 people debating it, was that the people who want dignity in dying want a particular pattern of behavior. The people who are now running hospices are adopting a pattern of behavior that is almost converging on the two patterns. So the, when you go, I did recently, I'm always going to hospitals to see dying friends. You, when someone is dying in, and the, in a hospital, they call up the hospice people who arrive and say, in my hearing, it's not a secret, I think you ought to put up the morphine. Please put up the morphine. 
the people who believe in dignity in dying also believe that you should be more, perhaps more open about that and make that kind of pattern of behavior, the relief of pain leading to a pain-free death. And I felt that the two points of view are Quite converging. Mm. And they will converge as much from the collaboration as the hospice movement, which I have been to address and have, who have accepted this point of view, as with the dignity and dying thing. Um, what is interesting at the law at the moment is defined in a very ambiguous way, deliberately, so that it, one, obviously, it is a sin, it's a cry of sin, it's a crime to kill people. This religious language is coming through it's all the time. Through. Um, it, it, it is a crime to kill people. However, in passing judgment, the courts are invited to consider certain circumstances which may ameliorate the harshness of the law in punishing that. Yeah. And these six circumstances, I won't go through them now, they were drawn up by Keir Starmer, yeah. incidentally, yeah. when he was director of public prosecutions. And these three circumstances allow for people who have, as it were, committed the crime to be not prosecuted. However, only the other day, someone was wheeled into the Lords, dot, is it Conway.com? Yeah. Conway. Who was, who was asking for his medication to be ended, and he was being refused. And he came to the House of Lords in his, well, it was more than a wheelchair, because he was lying down, and to speak and to make a case individually. And we can't go on like that, humiliating people in their final It is degrading, days. yeah. It's and degrading. Um, so there are individual situations where there is, seems to be no compassion yeah. But on the whole, the two seem to be moving Good. together. Well, that's interesting. That's a very interesting way of looking at it. Um, right, your chance. I see. Can't see. Well, can't hear. I, I see. It's okay. I, I will see there um, at the back. Um, thank you, Dame Benra. Um, I, um, I was interested in a comment you made um, a little, a few minutes ago, which was um, a rather sweeping comment, which was things change slowly, mm -hmm. and I wondered if. Actually, um, it's just the politicians that change slowly, because on most of the ethical issues that, that you've been talking about and we deal with in humanism, the population is usually way ahead of the politicians. Why is it the politicians are so slow in responding to that? Yes, it's a very good question. I mean, I ask that all the time at the House of Lords. Why is it taking us so long? Now, in human behavior is endlessly fascinating. I mean, it's just um, extraordinary because so many people have a vested interest in a pattern of behavior going at a certain speed. When you try, when, please note from now on, when you ever hear a news announcement about um, somebody being ca or concerned about stabbings or somebody concerned about the homeless, you know what they'll do? They'll set up a working party and they will report and then there will be a re debate about the report and then the report will be shelved until the next time and then there will be another emergency and they'll do the same again. People won't mobilize the political will in such numbers to come together. I suppose it's a result of everybody having a voice you know, that you ask everyone what they belong, uh, what they believe, and they will tell you, and they're all divergent. So you, it's very hard to carry. Um, okay, so there's a, a proposal that goes forward for debate um, about dignity in dying. Um, there will be a good debate about it. There has to be the first debate, the second debate goes back to the Commons, it, uh, the bill's amended, it's debated again. The mechanisms of Parliament are too arcane and archaic to meet the immediate needs. On the other hand, if of course it was something you disapproved of and thought was really dangerous, you would welcome the fact that there's a kind of break on it and that it won't get, it won't get instituted uh, immediately. So there are pluses and minuses, but this is a very constipated constitution that we have. It, no, it really is. That, that's definitely true. One of the things that working with Humanist International on some of our issues has, has shown definitely me in the last few years is that our, our political system is almost uniquely congested. 
the amount of internal consultation that goes on, even in either house, when a new law comes, yeah. there's a consultation with the bishops and a consultation with the parties, and then a, this stage and that stage, and nothing can, the odds against anything getting anywhere in time to deal with whatever crisis has precipitated. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are lots of, there's lots of goodwill. I sat on a committee, um, it's, this isn't a humanist issue, well, it might be, but it was about the seaside uh, towns suffering so bad eco in economic terms, okay? 18 intelligent, well-informed people come together every week for about six months to debate um, the welfare of seaside reports. We put out a request for submissions. We get over 2,000 submissions for us to read and consult and make notes on. We meet, we discuss. Eventually, we draw up a report. The report is published, um, and it, is, it gets about two paragraphs in the newspapers, um, and it now goes for debate, and it's coming up for debate in about six weeks' time. We will debate it. Everyone will say what a good report it was, and it's not possible that much will be done. What will tend to happen is the government will say, we welcome this report. It's absolutely important. It's crucial. It's part of our policy. It's what we believe in. In fact, we've been doing it, a lot of it already. There's money going into seasides. There's money going in there, and we'll perhaps do a little more someday. Hello, Jan. Yeah. Um, the, the current structures and procedures of the House of Lords have been in place for a long, long time and seem to suit the old men and the bishops very well. Um, you said earlier, I think, that uh, you hope for reform soon. Um, can you give us some idea of how soon or how much of a hope, <laughs> please? Quite soon isn't quite soon, I don't yeah. I tell you. Um, I have to say that everyone in the House of Lords knows its shortcomings. I mean, these are intelligent people. They're not, they're not trying to perpetuate things, things out of irritation. Um, they, they're, they're lawyers and diplomats and admirals and generals and people who run organizations and they know what it takes. So they set up a, com a committee to discuss changes in the House of Lords and the committee reported and drew up a plan which would cover the next 10 years. It's a long time, isn't it? And the thing already is going into, um, certain things have gone into operation, such as, there is no retirement age from the House of Lords, by the way, such as making it easier for people who are over a certain age mm. to, re to withdraw from the House and encourage them to do that. Um, but what is interesting in the House of Lords, the, um, there are 57 hereditaries that were left over from Tony Blair's um, reforms but when a hereditary peer dies, all the, arist all the gentry out in the shires with the landed estates and titles, they, they nominate another one. And so the, the hereditary is re replaced. So the, the hereditary peers aren't declining at all. Their numbers are being sustained. Well, I think that could go, frankly. Why, Why it? hasn't it gone? I mean, it's so weird. Know. It's just it's uh, to do with this rate of change. Yeah. There's some, you know, somebody will vote against it, that, and um, a lack of political will is the answer. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, here and then down here. There's quite a few hands now. Right. It, I can it, see you. Is is humanism a quasi religion? <gasps> do we want it to be? Say it again. He says, "Is the answer is no? Is is <laughs> is." Is humanism, is, he said, is, is humanism a quasi-religion and do we want it to be? I think this is something that's come out. Maybe you'd say a little bit about your own approach to humanism, actually, because one of the things that you said, and I've heard you speak about this before, is that you, you definitely have still a lot of cultural attachment to the sort of Christianity I that you grew have. up with. Of course with. I do. And I think that does lead to you and people, if I might say so, sometimes of your generation, who That's do right. have that sort of attachment, yes. compared with someone like me who never had a re you know that religious attachment. Yes. So that, that leads. That's not exactly the question because the question is: Is humanism a quasi-religion or should be? But I think that's part of what you've been. Sort it's of a very speaking interesting about. question because I mean, um, quasi-religion. What is a religion? Is uh, define a religion to begin with. What it is not. It is not a system of belief that in d depends for its underpinning on a structure of supernatural faith. In, it's a, a system of belief that is based on evidence and human contact. It does not depend on a god, whoever he may be or she, or where, however you de define this god person. It doesn't acknowledge that because it, I, personally speaking, I think we would all agree, believe the human spirit is what 
keeps us together and keeps us with a moral framework that is more reliable because it depends on us than having um, you know, a sky pilot with a white beard telling us what to believe. I believe in evidence-based behavior, creating a moral structure. Now, it, that might be, people of my age might call it a quasi-religion. I remember a friends in the BBC's religious department telling me that the Quakers weren't really Christian. They weren't really religion. They were a cult. And I thought, who says so? Who, who's, who says this? I mean, why? So I, I suppose I'm so used to saying, tell, tell me what you mean by a quasi-religion, and I'll tell you if I believe in it. But I, I, I would set definitions of that kind aside, because what matters is our faith in each other and our sense of moral strength, moral strength among human beings. It's not difficult. A child grows up with a sense of, but that's not fair. That's good, that's true, that's not true. It's innate, it's part of the human spirit. So we, the rest is myth and fun, and I've inherited a love of hymns and poetry and so on, um, but that's, that's another part of man's imagination. Uh, yes, here, Alan and then Bryony. And uh, there's a ha hand back there. We'll, 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 I'm sure we'll come to you, yeah. yeah. I, I think there's, there's time, yeah. I've been involved in trying Higher to... ice cream. Ah, how's that? Yeah. That's very okay. good. Right, I, I've been involved in uh, religious education in various categories for quite a long time. Now, we look at the latest uh, proposals. Uh, to change the title from uh, re religious education to religion and the world views. It's going halfway. We get divisions throughout the document itself into religious and non-religious. Um, belief in God, not belief in God. It's wholly dividing us up on these categories. What I've been trying to get, not succeeded yet, uh, is to change this approach to a course in humanity and living together within which the religions can get their due consideration like any other approach. Okay. But it is enormously difficult. I do recommend it. I, I admire your attempts and I hope they will meet with success. I think there's no doubt about it. We can't pretend that the, rel the religions of this world, since the time of those fabled drawings, those wonderful um, drawings that Adam was showing us, man has sought to ask, answer questions. Why is he here? What are we for? And what happens uh, when we die? And he has created the most fantastic myths out of his own mind, his imagination, out of his community, out of the artifacts and the, the, the circumstances in which he lives. And who can say that those great statues in Egypt are not sublimely interesting, although there was a very strange and convoluted religion behind them. So these are man's achievements. We don't deny man's achievements. Man is a creative, brilliant force. He is the where humanity has come to today. We don't need to actually believe in bodies coming from the dead and ascending to heaven. It's a wonderful story. Great literature, painting has built on it. But it, the belief in how we address what we are, what we're for, where we're going, what gives meaning to life, we give meaning to life. And that's the only way we'll make the world a better place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, I want to applaud that, don't you? Yes. Very good. Um, we'll, take, we'll take these two last uh, ones together. A number of important thinkers and great people have defined what humanism is. Has anybody tried to define what not humanism is? <laughs> and if, in fact, it's very little different from just being a human being, wouldn't it be better to, I'm, le I'm leaving aside people who actually belong to religions, 
everybody else would really be more or less a humanist, which would give you a constituency of about 40 million people in this country, which ought to have democratic weight in the House of Lords and the House of Commons. Well, Thanks. we could do without the parliamentarians for a moment. What is interesting is when people say, oh, you're a humanist, what does that mean? And I explain it to them. And they say, oh, I think that means I'm a humanist. I mean, a lot of people are leaving, leading lives without a need to go, go to church and worship a supernatural being, and they have a strong moral code underpinning what they behave. They might behave badly, but they will know what they're doing is bad. <laughs> People know when they're doing the wrong thing. Some, some don't. Okay, last, last point then from the Stand up so we can see you because it's quite difficult down here. A uh, question about how we get young people uh, more involved in humanism. Um, right now we've got Brexit going on, we've got climate change or the climate emergency. How does humanism cut through and how do we keep it relevant in the minds of the generation that are coming through so that they know what it is uh, as opposed to just being sort of apathetic atheists? Is that, is that the problem that you would identify at the moment? I mean, I know you've got insight on, on campus. I think that it was interesting that recently the humanist students were saying, whereas in the past they might have been dealing with sort of needing to promote humanism as against religion, now one of the problems is promoting humanism as against apathy. Is that...? Yeah, the, the new atheists uh, were great for getting young people involved. Um, but on campus now, climate change and Brexit have just taken over, basically. Well, I, see. I think climate change is a fantastic part of the humanist agenda. How can it not be? It's the planet that we have and that we're damaging. <laughs> Brexit is just a, an in, huge and irrelevant squabble about people who want to get richer and uh, trade in different ways in order to further their own interests and, and follow certain mistaken concepts of things like sovereignty. Yeah. But, I, but I, I think the issues that young people grab onto are the ones that matter. The survival of the planet, the health of their children, the pollution that we don't want. Um, they're very caring about each other. Um, I don't find them in, indifferent. I, I, I don't think that, I think there's, there's obviously apathy among people who've got sad lives who, or whose motives and family background make them despair of, uh, of ideas. But, but ideas will, what, you know, ideas have got us into this. And ideas have got to get us out of it. That's the message, really. We've had a really good first day, obviously. There's more to come. Uh, tomorrow, um, but I'm sure um, that before we all disperse, you want to join me in thanking a very powerful advocate that we have now in Parliament and in wider society for her contributions th today, this evening. We've got a lot to think about, actually, as a result. This feels like a very densely packed 40 minutes of gold <laughs> thank you uh, from Joan, so thank you very much. Thank you.